52. <clears throat> With George Herbert's the caller. Herbert was a contemporary of, of um, John Dunn, a little bit younger, about 20 years younger than him. Um, died three years, uh, two years after Dunn, and Herbert wrote only religious verse. It's it's all what's called devotional poetry, okay? Um, and this is one of the poems in the collection titled uh, The Temple, The Caller. I struck the board and cried, no more I will abroad. It's not how it needs to be read. It needs to be... Because what does that mean? I struck the board and cried, uh, no more I will abroad. Probably every one of you, I don't know, maybe in the last couple of years, has essentially said this. You said it with a lot fewer words. You said it with two sentences, one of them, um, two words, and the second one, three words. That's it. I'm out of here. That's what he said. All right. I will abroad. That is, I'm leaving. What? Shall I ever sigh and pine, sigh and pine, complain? My lines in life are free, free as the road, loose as the wind, as large as store. My lines in life are free, free as the road. Lines in life, he's talking like about like mooring lines, things that keep something stable in position. Okay? He doesn't have anything that keeps him bound, anything that keeps the speaker tied down. He is saying, the speaker is telling us, I could leave. I could check out at any moment. All right? Shall I be still in suit? The gloss tells you that means serving somebody else. Really? Do I always have to be serving somebody else? What's the real import of that? What's the speaker really saying? If the speaker's tired of serving somebody else, what does the speaker want to do? Me. It's time for me. Have I no harvest but a thorn to let me blood and over and not restore what I've lost with cordial fruit? Cordial meaning restore it. Talking about the thorn to let me blood, it's the old medical practice of, of bleeding. Cutting somebody, getting the bad blood out. And the cordial fruit, he's talking like about a medicinal drug. Not drug that we think of, but something made from plants, from herbs. A medicinal drink. Sure, there was wine before my sighs did dry. There was corn before my tears did drown. Both of those are Petrarchan images okay, that describe the lovers sighing and weeping and what the sighing and weeping cause. So, is the year only lost to me? And that's where the speaker essentially tells us that the speaker has been serving somebody else for a year. Okay? That the speaker has been kind of bound to somebody else for a year, even though the speaker doesn't have those mooring lines that I talked about. Is the year, have I only lost a year? Have I no bays? And your gloss tells you triumphal wreath that is like laurel wreath around his head. Do I not have any victory trophies? Do I not have, what's he really getting at? Anything to show for this last year. All blasted, all wasted, not so my heart. My heart, seed of passion. There is fruit, and thou hast hands. What's he mean? There is fruit, and thou hast hands. You go for a walk, maybe. And there's an apple tree, and it's got low-hanging apples, and they're ripe, and you're hungry, and the tree is behind a fence, but the branches hang over the fence. Who 
the apples belong to? Whoever's property the apple tree is growing on. Those apples don't belong to anybody just walking on along who wants to pick the apples. Okay? When the speaker says, there's fruit and I've got hands, that's an illusion. It's a biblical illusion. It's kind of like in the garden. Because what has the speaker been doing for the last year? He's not been doing what he wants. He's been doing what somebody else wants. And so he says, there's fruit, and I've got hands. I can serve my desires. So what's he going to do? Recover all thy cyblone age on double pleasures. That's why I said it's a biblical illusion. Pleasures. Why double? Why double pleasures? What's the speaker want to do for the last year? If he denied himself pleasures over the last year, notice what he's saying. Well, then I'm going to double it. I'm going to make up for what I lost and more. It's like when you hear stories, I told my first class, there's a guy a couple of years ago in Australia, goes to his doctor, has a bunch of medical tests, doctor calls him up the following week, got some bad news for you, you've got cancer. I think it was cancer. You've got three months to live. The guy is obviously distraught, he's destroyed, you know, pretty young guy if I remember right, 30s or 40s, and he's told he got three months to live. So, he gets the wild idea and takes out like 20 or 30 credit cards. I mean, he's getting credit card offers in the mail, so sends them off and spends the next three months around the world trip, just racking up credit card debt. He's got like $20,000 credit line, each one of these cards. He gets back from his trip, because he doesn't die in the three months, to find a letter from his doctor. Oops, there is a mix-up at the testing station. You weren't the one with, you know, terminal cancer. It was somebody with a digit, one number different. He immediately, you know, sues his doctor, sues the testing company. Why? Because he's now got like a couple hundred grand in credit card debt. And he doesn't have a couple hundred grand to pay it off. What did he attempt to do? He attempted to pack another 30 or 40 years of living in three months. That's what the speaker is trying to do. Okay? To recover that side blown age. How? Doubling it up. So, leave thy cold dispute of what is fit and not. A cold dispute, what is a dispute? If you have a dispute with somebody, what, what's going on? You have an argument. It's a cold dispute. I don't know about you, but usually when I get in an argument with somebody, it's heated. It's a hot dispute, okay? This one's cold. Why? Perfectly, totally rational. It's all up here. It's not in here. Okay? What's the dispute about? What is fit or not? Is this right or is this wrong? Is that fruit forbidden or not? Forsake thy cage. Thy rope of sands. What's the cage? What's the rope of sands? See, most of us, we understand what a cage is. You put a person in a cage, it's called a cell. You put an animal in a cage, it's called a cage or a crate. But it's got walls of some kind, door, gate, lock, you can't get out. But a rope of sands? You ever been to the beach and have somebody cover you up with sand? And then you get tired of being covered up with sand? What do you do? You get up. 
Sand doesn't make a very good rope. Which petty thoughts have made. Notice, petty thoughts have made the rope of sand. They've made the cage. What kind of thoughts are petty thoughts? What's petty mean? Small, little, insignificant. A petty cash box is where you put ones and change. It's not where you put $100 bills. Okay? So these are small, insignificant, little thoughts. What kind of thoughts are they? What is right and wrong? In these little thoughts that make a rope of sands, turn those rope of sands into what? Good cable. Now, we think of cable as the twisted wire kind of stuff. That's not what he means. Good cable in Herbert's day is talking about the rope that is used on ships, like the rope that is used around a capstan to raise and lower an anchor, okay? Which, in his day, would be anywhere from about that big in diameter to some of them, my arm's length, I've actually seen rope three feet in diameter. Why? Heavy anchor. Really heavy anchor. Right? So these petty thoughts have turned that rope of sand into this kind of cable. Notice, yeah, that'll keep them tied down. To do what? This cable is for what purpose? To enforce and draw and be thy law. Well, what will be the law? The petty thoughts. Law, that's a little bit different than just, you know, should I or shouldn't I, right? Well, what kind of law? While thou didst wink and wouldst not see. Wink, wink at what? Okay, he doesn't mean just wink like that. He means wink as in closing the eye. Why? I shouldn't see that. I, I don't want to see that. And yet, what are we told? He does want to see it. Away. Take heed. That is, I'm out of here again. I will abroad. Call in thy death's head there. What's a death's head? We saw it in Hamlet Act 5. Hamlet and Horatio find the gravediggers digging Ophelia's grave. And the grave digger throws up several skulls. And there's a Yorick, or Yorick skull. What does that serve as? A memento mori, reminder of death. Later on in that act, Hamlet and Horatio are talking about the impending fencing match Hamlet's going to have with Laertes. And Hamlet says, you know, I've got a bad feeling about this. Horatio tries to dissuade him from going through with it. You should follow your gut. Hamlet goes, yeah, but, you know, if I'm supposed to die now, I'll die now. If I'm supposed to die later, I'll die later. If I'm not supposed to die later, I'll die now. If I'm not supposed to die later, uh, die now, I'll die later. And then he gives one short, pithy kind of statement. The readiness is all. Meaning, should always be ready to die. Call it, don't remind me I'm going to die. You know, take the stupid little Surgeon General's warning off the pack of cigarettes. I don't want to hear that. Tie up thy fears. What fears? Well, what happens if I do something wrong? Louder? Go to hell. Might go to hell, might be that kind of fear. What else might it be? What happens if I steal this coat from the clothing store? What happens if I steal this bit of food? What happens if I speed? Consequences. You might get stopped. You might get a ticket. You might lose your license. You might get arrested for shoplifting. But those are all fears, right? Are they known that it's going to happen? Everybody in this room 
if you have a license and have driven. You've sped before. I know you have. I don't have any qualms about casting those aspersions on anybody. It might have only been one mile over the limit, but you've done it. Okay? There's that little part that said that, ah, but I shouldn't. Why? Because, uh, you know, old Bluey might be back there. Rrr, rrr, rrr. But they're usually not. Tie up thy fears. He that forbears to suit and serve his need deserves, deserves his load. What does that mean, to suit and serve his need? He that forbears, he that doesn't, suit, fill, and serve his need. Maybe he doesn't mean literal need, like hunger. Food is a need. Water is a need. Maybe he means desires. If you don't take what you want out of life, what? You get what you deserve. I'm one of those, you know, I tell people every election, you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. Why? Because that was suiting and serving your need. And I just saw a thing today. One of the elections, I think it's in California, still hasn't been determined. It's down to one vote in a congressional district. And so there's got to be a hand recount of all the votes. But as of right now, there's a one-vote discrepancy. Imagine being the one person who got up on you know, election morning and thought, I'm going to, eh, it's too busy. And what the hell, really? Because, you know, my vote doesn't matter. Oops. You don't, what? Get what you want out of life, then you get what you deserve out of life. But as I, what's the verb? Raved. What do you do when you rave and grew more fierce and wild? When you rave, what's going on up here? You're kind of losing control. And grew more fierce and wild. And he thought I heard one calling. Wish I had James Earl Jones's voice. Child. And I replied, My Lord. So what's the title? Because the title is C-O-L-L-A-R. Is this like dog collar? Heel! As the dog starts to run, what does the dog do? Er, my Lord. Is it that kind of collar? Is it the priest's clerical collar? And this is a priest who's thinking, you know, I want to go have some fun. I mean, there's fruit and I've got ants. And every time some thought like that happens, the rope of sand, he hears a voice say, child, where's the voice coming from? Is it coming from out there? Or is it coming from in here? We don't know. Okay, go from there to Shakespeare, page 1366. That time of year thou mayst in me behold. And what we have in this uh, sonnet is we get three quatrains and a couplet, as with all Shakespeare's sonnets. But with this one, in each of the three quatrains, we have an image, a different image. Okay? So, first quatrain. That time of year thou mayst in me behold, when yellow leaves are none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where, wait, where late the sweet birds sang. What's the image? It's in the first line. That time of year. What time of year is it? Fall. How do you know? Yellow leaves or none. So fall, late fall, early winter. Like, you know, hardly any leaves on the deciduous trees that are out here. Where yellow leaves or none or few do hang 
upon those boughs which shake against the cold. The tree branches are the boughs. Bare ruined choirs relate to sweet bird sang. We think of a choir as the people doing the singing. In Shakespeare's day, the choir was the place in a church where the choristers sang. Go to any cathedral or any large church in England, and you have the nave, and you have a kind of an area separating the nave from the altar area, and you have the altar over here, and right here you'll have what's called the choir. And there it's called the choir stalls. And it's places where the people stood okay, and sang. The bare ruined choirs are the empty trees. Okay. Why? Where have the birds gone? Flown south. They've left. So, first image into the year. Second image. In me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west. That's it, right there. It's the end of the day. Which by and by black night doth take away. Death's second self that seals up all in rest. Is it merely sunset? No, it's after sunset. Because when the sun sets, just goes over the horizon, the horizon still has the orange-red glow. It's after that, and it's now dark purple. It's before it's pitch black. Okay? Which, by and by, black night doth take away that light fading in the west. And notice black night is described as death's second self that seals up all in rest. Like the poem by Dunn that we read the other day, where Dunn talks about death being like rest and sleep. Notice Black night seals up all in rest. How? Because that's when people go to sleep. That's how it's an image of death. So, first image into the year, second image into the day. Third image. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie. And there it is. It's a dying fire. As the deathbed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. If you've ever been on a bonfire, if you've ever been camping or something, you build a fire up at night, and then you let it burn, and you wake up in the morning, there's a pile of ashes. Are the ashes cold? No, unless it was a really small fire. Okay? Are the ashes glowing? No. What do you have to do to build a new fire? You stir the ashes to bring the coals, the embers, out from under the ash, put new stuff on top. But what is the ash? The ash is the remnant of the previous fuel. That is the youth that was consumed by what it was nourished by. Okay? So, end of the year, end of a day, end of a fire. Then Shakespeare turns what's being suggested. So you can see in me the end of a year. You can see in me the end of a day. You can see in me the end of a fire. What is the speaker suggesting about himself? Or at the very least, I'm getting ready to leave. But with the fire image, the end of the year, end of a day, what does that imply? New year's coming, new day's coming. Not with the fire. The fire implies I'm dying. Okay? This thou perceivest. That is, you see this, which makes thy love more strong. Right? If you know somebody is dying, what do you, you know, a loved one, what do you want to do? You want to be with that person. I don't care what your politics are. You want to read a, a really touching testament to the power of friendship? Read about President Bush's last hours when his best friend for 60 years was at his deathbed rubbing his feet for the last 30 minutes of his life. A man in his 80s. That's friendship. Why? He knew he didn't have 
This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong. It's in the New York Times, by the way. To make thy love more strong. To do what? To love that well. And then what do we expect to read? Which thou must lose ere long. Why? Because I'm dying. So you're loving me even more. But that's not what Shakespeare writes. What Shakespeare writes is to love that will which thou must leave ere long. The person being addressed is going to leave the person who's described as possibly dying. He just turns the expectation upside down. Makes you wonder why. Why must this other person leave? And it's some of the other sonnets. It gets not explained, but he just does the image again and again. And if there is an explanation, it's something along the lines of the speaker doesn't want the other person to mourn when this person dies, so to speak, or goes. Okay? Now, big shift. Go from there to Dover Beach on... 846. Okay. 853. You got to do what? 10, 15, 11, 15. Yeah, we don't have time to do these. So Dover Beach. Written in 1867. Very important book. Written eight years previous. On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, in which Darwin argues, suggests, humanity doesn't descend, doesn't come from an act of God, but comes from natural selection and evolution, the evolutionary process. So rather than be, being created by God in his image, we descend from apes. Okay. What else? It's written in 1867. What begins around 1700 is a period called the Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason. Okay. And what happens in the Western world as a result of the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason is humanity's ability to solve humanity's problems through the application of reason rises and humanity's need for religious faith falls. Okay? As well as humanity's need for religious faith to explain the nature of life becomes replaced with the idea that we can kind of create perfect people, etc. through the application of science. Dover Beach the sea is calm tonight. The tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the streets. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land, listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. And I should have brought one into class. If you've ever had a rain stick or heard a rain stick, you know, about this long, it's got little pebbles in it, you could turn it upside down and you hear the, and then you turn it again and it does the same thing. It's almost the exact same sound if you've ever been to a rocky beach. And I don't mean rocky cliffs and boulders, but rocky, a lot of pebbles, where it's not sand, it's just rock. The rock rolls as the sea comes in, and then it rolls again out as the tide goes out. So, 
The speaker is at Dover, looking out a window across the English Channel to the coast of France. If you ever get an opportunity to go to England, take the hour and a half train ride from London, if you're in London, go to Dover. If it's a clear day, you can see the 30 miles and see the coast of France. This is at night. How do we know? Because he talks about the lights on the coast. And the speaker says, come to the window. Why come? What does come imply? Somebody being addressed. You don't say come to yourself because that's weird. <laughs> You're addressing somebody else. So come here, come here. Listen. Smell the night air. And what does he do? He says, listen to that sound of the ocean. You hear the grating roar of pebbles, which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand. And then he gives us, through sound, kind of the sound of the ebb and flow of the tide. Begin and cease and then again begin. Notice the repetition of the in sound. Begin, then, again, begin. It's in and out and in and out. And how does he describe that sound? How many of you like to go to the beach? He's raised in California, 30 miles from Santa Cruz. Go to the beach three or four times. I was in, we didn't go a lot because you have to go to the mountains and stuff. But go to the beach three or four times a summer. My wife's in Jacksonville, Florida. She and her sister went to the beach every day because they were 15 miles, 15 minutes. I don't think I've ever been to the beach and heard the eternal note of sadness. What kind of person would go to the beach and get depressed? Okay. Because that's essentially what that's saying. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. Right? Notice, Sophocles heard that same sound, the ocean coming in and going back out, coming in and going back out. And what's it make him think of? Human misery. We, we also find a thought. That is, the in and out, the in and out, gives us a different idea than Sophocles. Why did Sophocles, you know, what was the thought of human misery? You read it. It's in the play um, Oedipus the King. It's the very last line. Count, <clears throat> count no man happy till when? Till he is dead, free of pain at last. Yeah, that's an eternal note of sadness. Because what does that mean? There is no pleasure in life. There is no joy in life. Okay? We also find in the Sada found, in the sound, a thought. What's the thought? The sea of faith was once too at the full. And round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. This is the thought that the sound of the ocean brings to Arnold's speaker. Okay? What's the thought? The world was once encompassed, enclosed, if you want, by what? A sea, an ocean of faith. The faith doesn't have to be a specific religious faith. It's not necessarily Christianity. It's not necessarily Judaism. It's not necessarily Islam or Buddhism or any other specific faith. It is any kind of faith. Okay? Or was. But now? Now what? I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind. The sea of faith is like the ocean going out. 
when the tide goes out? Why is it a long, melancholy roar? Well, what did the Sea of Faith offer? Peace? What else? Hope? What else? What did the misfit lack? Why did he say he wouldn't be what he was if he'd been there when Jesus rose the dead? Because then he'd have known. It offered certainty. It offered certitude. It offered certitude, joy, peace, hope, love. Oh, now, let us be true to one another. For the world, which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams. Two words there. Seems like. Drives me crazy when I hear my 26-year-old daughter and my 23-year-old son, who's in law school, you know, use the word like so much. It's, you know, it's the, it's the phrase of our generation, your generation. It's like this, you know, and I'm like, no, what do you mean it's like that? It either is or it isn't, okay? The world which seems, we've talked about that verb before, seems is what? It's not is. The world seems to lie before us like a land of dreams. It isn't a land of dreams. If someone says, you know, Rattlesnake, mm, tastes like chicken. That's what I've heard. What does that mean? It's not chicken. Tastes like it, but it's not. Okay? So if the world seems like a land of dreams, what's the speaker saying? It's not. Then notice, dreams, right? Dreams are those good experiences you have while you're sleeping. Because what's the other thing? Nightmares. It seems like a land of dreams. So various, so beautiful, so new. That's Gerard Manley Hopkins's Pie Beauty. Kind of shrunk into one line. So beautiful, so various, so new. But the world hath really Neither. What is that saying? Is that like? No. Is that seems? No. He's saying this is the way the world really is. It hath neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain. All six of these are things that the sea of faith once gave. So what are these things that the sea of faith gave get replaced with? Because if it doesn't have joy, then what does it leave us with? Well, Sophocles, misery. If it doesn't have peace, conflict. Love, excuse me, joy, love, hate, light, darkness, certitude, doubt, peace, conflict, nor help for pain, sorrow. Or, as one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite films says, life is pain. Highness, Princess Bride. So what does the speaker say then? Let's kill each other. Double suicide. Why? Life sucks. Then you die. Nope. And here we are on a darkling plain swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight. Why is it a darkling plain? Because the world doesn't have any light. We're like blind men stumbling around. And what do we hear? We are confused. We are swept, excuse me, with confused alarms of struggle and flight. 
What are the alarms of struggle and flight? Where ignorant armies clash by night. They are the noises made by the ignorant armies. Well, who are the ignorant armies? Ignorant means literally not knowing. They're the sounds made by those who say they know. Christians over here, all the Bible says. Muslims over here, the Quran says. Uh, conservatives over here, Trump says. Democrats over here, Bernie says. Pick your oppositional force. Okay? I mean, you, you could go down with a whole list of them. And what the speaker is saying is, all those binaries, they're ignorant. Why? Because here on earth, there is no certitude. We can never know. We can never be sure. And that's why they clash by night. Now, how did he begin this stanza? Go back to the beginning. All love. Let us be true to one another. And then he finishes it. Put yourself, assume this is a heterosexual relationship, put yourself, and assume it's a male speaker, in the girl's shoes. What's she, what she thinking? Because he just said, there is no real love, there is no real blah, blah, blah. Let's be true to one another. F you, buddy. How can we be true to one another when there is no true? True meaning fidelity. Faithfulness. Because if you don't have truth or certitude, you don't have love, you don't have, there is no faithfulness. Okay? And that's why Anthony Hecht writes this parody of the poem. Because Arnold's speaker wants you to say, well, even though that we can never really know anything, you know, we can still kind of act like we can it is taking an idea to its logical extreme and showing you cannot live according to that. So, Hecht writes the parody, which you get. I've got another one. Which, you know, What's, what's he do with the parody? So I knew this girl that Matthew Arnold invited down to the beach one night. And she's thinking what when they're at the beach? He's standing there and looking out the window, talking about how crappy the world is. And she's imagining what it would like to feel his whiskers on the back of her neck. She wants to make out. And he's here talking about how life sucks. Well, she went down there for what purpose? Hookup. Sex. And he's sitting there treating her as a cosmic last resort. In other words, well, life sucks, but hey, we can still have fun. And the speaker in Heck's version says, you know, I knew this girl. We used to get together with her once in a while, you know, and she'd put out. That is, we'd have sex, you know, and we get together every now and then, once a year. Yeah, she's running to fat. Why? She's getting old. But he says, you know, it's still good. Yeah, you know, every now and then I bottle, buy her a bottle of Nuit de Mour, which is French. It's kind of perfume. It means night of love. Notice what Heck does. He reduces the kind of false romantic notion of love that Arnold kind of introduces to it's just sex. It's just sex. Okay? Why? Because Arnold's whole poem kind of reduces to that. There's nothing special, you know, about humanity, so to speak. Okay. Dolce et decorum S. 10, sorry, 8.53. Got just enough time. Written by Wilfred Owen, notice his dates, 1893 to 1918. He died in the First World War. His poems were discovered after his death. Okay? 
bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock knee, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. We know that's true. In the First World War, we've got eyewitness accounts of guys being literally asleep and still marching. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshot. All went lame, all blind. Not literally blind, but falling asleep while marching. Drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of gas shells, dropping softly behind. Mustard gas. Notice, they're deaf initially, and then they realize gas. Gas! Quick, boys. Why? Because they've got to take their packs off, get them off, get the gas masks out. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Lime is an acid. I've been on fire before. I was six years old. Family barbecue thing, stuff got on my leg. I ran around like a damn fool. Why? I didn't know that you put out fire on a person by rolling. You, you know, my brother tackled me and rolled me in the ground. This guy does this. Why? Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. How is he drowning? Because his lungs are turning to liquid. That's what mustard gas does. It liquefies your lungs. He's looking through glass because it's the color of the pane in his gas mask, and it's the color of the gas. In all my dreams, before my hopeless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. So when this poor speaker falls asleep and dreams, what does he see? This guy. And then he gives us two if clauses. If in some smothering dreams you two could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sack of sin. Why did they fling him in the, in the um, wagon? Why did they gently place him? Because he was dead. He wasn't literally dead, but there was nothing they could do for him. They flung him because they got to get out of there. They got to get away from the gas. Okay? And what happens? The guy's eyes are writhing. Why? Because he knows he's dying and there's nothing they can do. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, you know, the wagon wheel hits a rut. The wagon bounces. <laughs> That's what happens. So if you could see and hear all this, bitter as the cud, obscene as cancer, a vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. Now, those could be literal sores on the soldier's tongue caused by the gas, but they could also be the words that are spoken to children. Then, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children art for some desperate glory, the old lie. What's the old lie? Dolce et decorum as pro patria mori. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. He's not saying it's not right to die for one's country. He's not saying it's not patriotic. He's saying don't describe it as beautiful and appropriate. Why? As one of my relatives said, war is hell. Death in battle, it's never pretty. Okay, that's all. Remember, um, for those who came in late, we're not having class on Wednesday because uh, i got to go to some tests with my wife. Um, I will post all the quizzes from the poetry period. Poetry stuff forward um, to an email. The exam structure... Uh, next week will be exactly like previous exams, okay? The actual exam part will just be over poetry. The extra credit, 30 to 50 points worth, will go all the way back to the beginning, okay? So study previous exams, previous quizzes, previous notes and such for preparation for that part. All right. Uh, date and time and place around the syllabus.